So we're in Genesis 10 this morning. And we come this morning to the end of the road for Noah. We began our look into the life of Noah in Genesis 6. As God looked upon the earth and regretted that he had made man. God chose Noah, an upright man who obeyed God and heralded righteousness on the earth. And God promised to covenant with Noah after he brought a judgment of a flood upon the earth. God commanded Noah to build a large boat to house what would prove to be the only surviving beings in whose lungs were the breath of life. And God deluged the earth in a catastrophic flood, the likes of which this world has never seen nor will ever see again. Now God remembered Noah, and after 40 days and 40 nights, he began to allow the floodwaters to subside and brought Noah out of the ark a full year after he had ordered him onto the vessel. Noah worshipped God with burnt offerings, and God, in turn, blessed Noah with the blessings of procreation, dominion over the animals in the eating of meat, and protection of civil government over the life of man. God promised to never again flood the whole earth and provided a sign of his promise to Noah and all future generations called the rainbow. Wickedness quickly overtook this new world as Noah's youngest son Ham sinned against his father and Noah was forced to curse Ham's son Canaan while providing a blessing to Shem and Japheth. And today we arrive at the culmination of Noah's life, the offspring We will conclude today our final chapter in our series from Genesis 6 through Genesis 10. The title of the sermon this morning is A Genealogy of God's Blessing and Promise. Look with me at verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. Well, we begin the chapter with a book end. And we're going to end the chapter with another book end. This is a genealogy of Noah and his sons. And we're going to find out today that a whole lot of children were born to these men in this frightening new world. Now, I realize that when some people hear the word genealogy, you might think of a long, boring list of people that you know nothing about whose names are so difficult to pronounce that they may as well have been named during a sneeze. (laughs) What we must remember, however, is that genealogies are a part of God's word, that their inclusion is significant and meaningful and that they were not snuck into scripture by some scribe just trying to make your life more difficult. Now, many of you know that I love genealogies. You may not share my love, that's okay. There, there's just so much significance wrapped up in these genealogies. At the same time, I do understand that they can be a bit of a marathon, okay? And that's why when it comes to chapter 10, I won't ask you to run this marathon with me any longer than one Sunday. So we'll attempt to move with haste this morning, and we're going to cover the entirety of the chapter. It's a thinking cap Sunday, okay? All right. So let's get started. Verses 2 through 5 of Genesis chapter 10, the sons of Japheth. Let's read together. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Tagarma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. 
verses 2 through 5 are the sons of Japheth. So we begin first with the line of Japheth. Now, this section on Japheth is the, Japheth is the shortest in this chapter. In the last chapter, Japheth would receive a blessing from Noah, but his blessing would be through Shem or through the tents of, uh, of Shem. In other words, Japheth's blessing would be in and through Shem rather than a direct blessing given to Japheth. And Japheth is really the least important figure here because not much is said about his line in this chapter. He was, however, obedient in covering his father in the last chapter, unlike Ham, and so he received a blessing. But we'll look through this his lineage and we'll point out some significant people. Now, I just want to say at the outset, when we stop to realize that all of us in this room have descended from these three men and that the legacy of these three men lives on today in all of the people groups on this globe that are scattered around this earth, it really makes one feel the smallness of the earth. We like to say that, right? Oh, it's a small world. Every time we meet somebody that knows somebody that knows us from far away, oh, it's a small world. It is a small world. But we're all descended from these common ancestors. And the truth is, it's a small world. We're led today to believe that the earth is billions of years old, that mankind cannot be traced back to one common ancestor, that death has occurred for millions of years, that our existence on this cosmos is but sheer chance, and that we are no better or more important than a chimpanzee, an elephant, or Shamu. But friend, as we pause to consider life in this new world after the global flood, we realize that the flood took place in the year 2348 BC. That means that in 2019, the flood only happened less than 4,370 years ago. That's when all of these people in our chapter today started to be born. It's really amazing. God's been working out his purposes on this globe for a relatively short amount of time. And the legacy and progeny of these people groups still lives on in us. And God will continue to work his purposes in and through us and on to the end of the age. It's his world, friends. It's his world. It's his timing. It's his people. It's all about him. Amazing. Well, Japheth's kids, verse 2, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus, seven sons. Okay, so first off, we're going to eliminate from our discussion Madai and Tyrus there in verse 2, and we're going to eliminate them because nothing more is said about them in Scripture than simply just to list them as Japheth's sons. That's it. So we're down to five sons, okay? Let's make a couple of notes. Gomer, Magog, Javan, Tubal, and Meshach. Now, these five sons of Japheth all have something in common. First of all, they all become nations, nations. Secondly, they're all mentioned again in the book of Ezekiel. So this would be about 1,750 years after they were born to Japheth. All five of these sons are again mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. So their names lived on, their legacies lived on. So Ezekiel is written somewhere around 571 BC or about 1,750 years after the flood. Now, of the five sons, three of them are also named in Ezekiel 27. Now, Ezekiel 27 is a prophecy where Ezekiel predicts the destruction of Tyre. So God destroys Tyre, and included in this destruction are the nations of Javan, Tubal, and Meshech. But again, of the five sons, four of them are mentioned in Ezekiel 38. So Ezekiel 27 and Ezekiel 38. And that's going to be Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Meshech. Those are the ones that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Okay. Now, we're not going to get into Ezekiel 38 today. This is a tough passage. Ezekiel 38 and 39 are tough passages. I believe Ezekiel 38 to be a future event, future meaning it hasn't happened yet. And Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe a battle 
in which many nations, including Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Meshech, are involved. And Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Meshech are going to go to battle against the nation of Israel in Ezekiel 38. So this battle is going to take place in the end times, but prior to the millennium. So these nations, these sons of Japheth, are at some point in the future, future from us, going to go to war with the nation of Israel, and they are going to be destroyed. And this is what God says of his victory in Ezekiel 39, 7. And my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned any more. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it will be brought about, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. So the sons of Japheth are significant in that they play a role in 2348 B.C., then within a prophecy around 580 B.C., and then in the fulfillment of that prophecy at some point in the future. So God's in charge. God's in charge of the offspring of Japheth in Genesis 10. And God's using the gift of procreation that he promised in his covenant with Noah and Noah's sons and the blessing of Japheth to bring about a people who will reject him and who he in turn will judge and show his mighty power, a nation he will depose to bring about the deliverance of the nation of Israel. It's pretty amazing. Okay, now, so Japheth's seven sons. <clears throat> so of those seven sons, Moses only goes on to list the children of two of them here in our passage this morning, and that's Gomer and Javan. Gomer comes first. Look at it there with me in the text. Gomer has some sons. He has three of them. And Gomer's son, Ashkenaz, is going to be named in Jeremiah 51 as one of the nations that God will use to destroy the nation of Babylon. Riphath, however, gets no such honorable mention, as nothing else of note is said about him in Scripture. Tagarma, however, is another one of the nations in Ezekiel 38 that will rise up and attack Israel. So these are Gomer's sons. Now next is Jabin. Javan has four sons, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Elisha is named as one of the nations that made banners for the nation of Tyre in Ezekiel 27. You're going to see Ezekiel 27 and Ezekiel 38 coming up quite a bit as we go through this genealogy in Genesis 10. Now, Tarshish plays a grand role in scripture as the nation is known for its shipbuilding. And this is discussed in several Old Testament books. But it is also the city, if you'll recall, to which Jonah tried to flee when God had ordered him to go and preach repentance to Nineveh. Jonah flees to Tarshish of the line of Japheth. Now, Tarshish will also show up in Ezekiel 38 as one of the nations that rises up against Israel. And Kittim is also mentioned a couple of times in scripture as a country known for its shipbuilding. That's about it. And yet we find Dodanim mentioned only here in Genesis 10.4. Now look with me at verse 5 here in Genesis 10. Verse 5 is quite interesting. We learn that the sons of Javan, so Japheth's grandsons, they become coastland people. And this would make sense as Tarshish and Kittim are both described as shipbuilding nations elsewhere in scripture. But we learn something else very interesting from verse 5. We learn that the sons of Javan dispersed, not just by their clans, not just by their nations, but there in verse 5 it says that they dispersed by their languages, by their languages. And this is going to become important in our next chapter because we're going to discuss in Genesis chapter 11 the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Up to this point, everyone spoke a common language. But verse 5 is our first glimpse into multiple languages. So we'll look forward to that next time. Well, these are the descendants of Japheth. And the most notable thing about them, other than the fact that they are shipbuilders, is that most of them are going to turn against their brother Shem, or rather his descendant Israel, 
and be destroyed. That really is the most significant thing about the genealogy of Japheth. Now let's move on to Noah's youngest son, Ham. Verses 6 through 14 describe the first three sons of Ham. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Now, folks, you realize as we go through these names that we're only hitting the highlights, right? So Moses is giving these names to his audience as he writes Genesis, and he's giving these names to his audience for a reason. Because his audience is whom? Moses' audience is Israel. And Israel has already at the writing of this and will interact with these nations that are being described. So they're meaningful to Israel, as Moses writes. And God, by delineating the birth order of these clans and nations, is showing to Israel the fulfillment of not only his blessings, but also his curses. He's allowing us today to see his dealings with mankind and faithfulness to his covenant people. Now, Ham has four sons. Verses 6 through 14 describe the first three and their progeny, Cush, Egypt, and Put. Now, a couple of translations will have the word Mizraim instead of Egypt there. So I'll make note of that. Mizraim is Egypt. And if you look on into Exodus, you won't see the transliteration of the word Hebrew word Mizraim, but in fact, the word Egypt. Now, the word Egypt comes from a Greek word, actually. Um, and it's a Greek word for one of the Egyptian gods. So just know that Mizraim and Egypt are synonymous here, okay? But the first son that we'll look at is Cush. Now, Cush is modern-day Ethiopia. Ethiopia. I told you, these, these names in these genealogies, they live on into the people groups today. God has been dealing his purposes in our world for a relatively short amount of time, and these nations live on the modern-day Ethiopia. And Cush appears again in Numbers chapter 12. If you remember, Moses marries someone that Miriam and Aaron are unhappy about. Moses marries a Cushite woman. So Moses marries into the line of Ham. And Miriam and Aaron get angry with Moses for marrying a Cushite. And God gets very angry with Miriam and Aaron because they opposed Moses, who was appointed by God as his mouthpiece to his covenant people. Again, in 2 Samuel, after Joab killed David's son Absalom, if you remember, Joab sends a Cushite man to run and bring the news to David that Absalom is dead. Cush is also mentioned in Psalm 68 as one nation that will stretch out their hand in praise to God. And again, Cush is named in Ezekiel 38 as yet another one of the nations that will rise up against Israel in the end times. The next son of Ham is Egypt, Mizraim. Now, I believe this son needs very little introduction. For Egypt will enslave the people of Israel for 400 years, only to have every firstborn son in the entire nation die in one night. And then shortly thereafter, the Pharaoh and his entire army be violently killed as the walls of the Red Sea collapse onto them. Paul will write about this even in Romans 9 and declare that God raised that specific Pharaoh up so that God might show his power and his might to Egypt and that God's name might be proclaimed in all the earth. The name Egypt will live on as the fulfillment of the prophecy by the prophet Hosea, when in Hosea chapter 11, he declares that Jesus will come out of Egypt. And so we see Mary and Joseph flee with the Christ child to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod, and the prophecy is fulfilled. Egypt will be a cornerstone of God's loyal love to his people, as Stephen will preach about it in 
to the high priest in Acts 7 just prior to his execution. Followed by Paul in Acts 13 to the men in the synagogue in Antioch, Greece. Egypt will again be mentioned in Revelation 11 as the two witnesses are killed and lie in the street of the great city, which Revelation 11.8 says is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. The third son of Ham here is Put. Put would be modern day Libya. Libya. Now, there's not much said about Put, although he is mentioned as one of the nations in Ezekiel 27, which is the lament of the destruction of Tyre. Put is mentioned there as a nation of war. And again, Put is mentioned in, you guessed it, Ezekiel 38, as yet another nation that will rise up against Israel. Our fourth son is Canaan. Canaan would be the son that was cursed in Genesis 9 after Ham looked upon his father's nakedness and reported it to his brothers. And we know Canaan well. Canaan would be the land flowing with milk and honey that God would deliver into the hands of Israel. That God would punish Moses with a prohibition of entry for striking the rock. And that God would bring conquest to by his servant Joshua as he led the armies of Israel to overtake Canaan. Canaan would be the land which God would command the armies of Israel to utterly destroy and wipe off the face of the land. And yet through the disobedience of Israel, God would subject the Canaanites to slavery as he promised in Genesis chapter 9. Now, only three of Ham's four sons get their children recorded here in our text, and that's Cush, Egypt, and Canaan. As far as put, that's all we have, so we'll put him to bed. No recorded progeny for put. Well, let's briefly look at the sons of Cush here. There's five of them, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca. Well, Seba gets an honorable mention in Psalm 72. This psalm uh, may have been written by Solomon and is a cry to God to give justice and equity to the king of Israel. In Psalm 72, Seba is called upon to bring gifts to the king of Israel. Also in Isaiah 43, God is speaking to Israel and assuring them of his loyalty and redemption. And here in Isaiah 43, God mentioned that he has redeemed Israel with Ham's son Cush and Ham's grandson Seba. Now we come to Havilah, and Havilah is perhaps the most interesting grandson of Ham, because if you remember our study in Genesis 2, Moses describes the location of the Garden of Eden, and he describes four rivers that flow out of the garden. One of the rivers is the river Pishon, Pishon, and this river flows around the whole land of Havilah. Havilah was a land of gold. Now, what we can't be sure of in our text this morning is whether or not it's the same Havilah, because anyway, down in verse 29 of our text, I guess Shem's great-great-grandson, Jochten, decided to share a family name and call his son Havilah as well. So whether or not Genesis 2 refers to Ham's grandson or Shem's great-great-grandson, great-great-great-grandson, we're not sure. But nothing else is said of Avila in Scripture. But well, we come to Sabta, Rama, and Septeca, and all we get is one verse on Rama. The other two are silent. And Rama is said to have been a trading partner with the city of Tyre in Ezekiel 27. So we're seeing how Ezekiel 27 and Ezekiel 38 are two very significant chapters when it comes to the listing of the table of nations here in Genesis 10. Well, then Rama, the trading partner of Tyre, has a couple of sons, and his sons are Sheba and Dedan. And maybe the most, most notable mention of Sheba in the Bible is its queen, the queen of Sheba. <clears throat> so in 2 Chronicles 9, the queen of Sheba is going to see the wisdom of Solomon, and she's going to help him build the temple of God. She gives him gold and spices and precious stones. And Solomon returns the kindness and grants to the queen of Sheba whatever she desires. Sheba's mentioned again 
in the same psalm in which Seba is mentioned, Sheba is called upon to bring gold to the king of Israel. Jeremiah also mentions the spices of Sheba as he says that frankincense comes from that land. And once again, Sheba takes a darker note as he is mentioned in, you guessed it, Ezekiel 27 and Ezekiel 38 as a trading partner of Tyre and one that will rise up against the nation of Israel. Dedan is also going to be mentioned in Ezekiel 25 as one that will be destroyed. Dedan will also be included as a trading partner with Tyre in Ezekiel 27 and as a force against Israel in Ezekiel 38. Okay, so now in verse 8 of our passage this morning, Moses takes us on a special detour to one of Cush's sons, and that's Nimrod. Nimrod. Moses points out that Nimrod is the first on earth to be a mighty man. He then goes on to provide more clarity to the statement, and he states that Nimrod was a mighty man in that he was a mighty hunter, a mighty hunter. And there was actually a saying about Nimrod. He was such a mighty hunter. So he was kind of an icon. Now, Nimrod is only mentioned one other time in scripture by the prophet Micah, in Micah 5. But other than a simple mention, there's really no information given. The only clue, the only clue that we might have about Nimrod is from Genesis 6, 4. In Genesis 6, we dealt with the question of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And in verse 4, Moses wrote this, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And in that sermon, if you recall, I took the position, albeit not dogmatically, that the sons of God were not angels, but simply human, and that the resulting progeny of these unions were the mighty men, humans and not half angels, half men. Well, here in Genesis 10, Nimrod may lend a clue as to the humanity of the men in Genesis 6. All right, moving on to verse 10. What's so important about Nimrod? He's mentioned here in Genesis 10 and once in Micah 5, and very little information is given about him. So what is so important about Nimrod that Moses would take a detour and talk about him at length? Well, Nimrod was not only mighty, but he also built a kingdom. He built a kingdom. In the beginning of his kingdom, the first kingdom was the kingdom, you'll see there in your verse, of Babel. Babel. Now he had other areas of his kingdom as well, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. But the most notable territory was, of course, Babel. And this is most likely the same Babel that we'll study next time in Genesis chapter 11. And something very important happens in Babel. We're pretty sure it's the same Babel because both chapter 10 and chapter 11 tell us that the Babel in question existed in the land of Shinar. So the Babel in Genesis 10 existed in the land of Shinar and the Babel in Genesis 11 existed in the land of Shinar. So it is quite likely that Nimrod founded the first city in his greater kingdom the city of Babel. But Babel was just the tip of the iceberg for Nimrod as he would go on to found the cities of Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, Rezin, and of course the infamous Nineveh. So Nimrod, Nimrod would be used of God to found a city that years later through the preaching of an Israelite prophet would repent and turn to God. And that's Jonah. And then years after that, Jesus would speak these words in Luke 11:30. Listen with me. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the son of man be to his generation. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. That's the queen of Sheba. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh 
will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So it would be through Nimrod that God would raise up a Gentile nation to condemn the nation of Israel for rejecting their Messiah. Interesting guy, that Nimrod. I don't think he knew all of that about himself. All right. Verse 13 and 14, (coughs) excuse me, gives us the children of Egypt. And I'll just let you go ahead and breathe a sigh of relief for a moment because the Bible just doesn't say much about any of Egypt's sons. Okay, so breathe. Ludum gets an honorable mention in Jeremiah, and Kephtarim gets an honorable mention in Deuteronomy. But other than that, the Bible is silent on these other boys. There is one child of Egypt, however, which Moses makes a note, and that is Kasluhim. And from Egypt's son, Kasluhim, would come the Philistines. The Philistines. And the Philistines would be a notable people group in the Old Testament, as they would be a thorn in the side of Israel throughout its history. But moving on to Ham's fourth and final son, the cursed son, verse 15 through 20. Okay, now if you're watching the clock, I'll just let you know, it's going to be virtually impossible to introduce you to the sons of Canaan all in one sermon, right? And I don't feel that it will be beneficial to spend a second sermon in Genesis 10 providing an overview of Canaan's children. Now, Japheth's kids and Ham's other kids, there's just not a whole lot said about them in Scripture, so it's much easier to provide kind of a concise overview very quickly. But the children of Canaan are a different story. (laughs) Okay, so allow me to summarize the children of Canaan. In Genesis 9, God cursed Canaan as a punishment for his father's sin. So God was punishing Ham, and Ham's punishment was to have Canaan cursed. And he cursed Canaan to be a servant of servants to his brothers. That was the curse. Ham's son Canaan would be a servant of servants to Japheth and Shem. That was the curse. And the list of Canaan's children in verses 15 through 20 are the servants of servants. We saw last time that in Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 17, God commands Moses the following commandment. But in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, this is Canaan and Canaan's progeny. In the city, in those cities that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. But you shall devote them to complete destruction, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded. So God commands Israel, take no prisoners. Utterly destroy them, the descendants of Canaan. And do you think Israel obeyed? No. Israel did not obey. So then, in Joshua 9, the sons of Canaan, they're still around, they come together to do war with Israel. And the Hivites, the Hivites are sons of Canaan, they know Israel's going to destroy them. The Hivites are scared because Israel had just destroyed Jericho and Ai. And so the Israel, the Hivites are scared. So the Hivites trick Joshua into thinking they're from some distant land and, and, and they ask Joshua not to destroy them. And so Joshua covenants with them that he will not destroy them. Well, when he reaches the land of the Hivites and realizes their trickery, he stands by his covenant and he does not destroy them, but rather fulfills the curse in Genesis 9 and subjugates the Hivites to slavery. 
He says in Joshua 9:23, now therefore you are cursed and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And there's the curse of Canaan from Genesis 9. Then again in Judges 1:28, the Bible says, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. There's the curse on Canaan from Genesis 9. And all the way into 1 Kings 9, we see these same nations being subjugated to the descendants of Shem. 1 Kings 9.19 says, All the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, what happened to them? These Solomon drafted to be slaves. And so they are to this day. But probably the most interesting part of the Canaanites is their land, their land. Verse 19 describes to where they dispersed and the lands to which they dispersed were what lands? They were the very lands to which God would command Abram in our very next chapter to go. Abram would leave Ur of the Chaldeans and journey to the cursed Canaan. And years after Abram's death, God would give the land of Canaan into the hands of Joshua. Canaan's curse. Canaan's curse. Well, we move now into the final portion of this chapter, Genesis 10, and the most important portion at that. We look now at the chosen son of Noah, the son through whom God would keep his promise to Adam and to Eve to bring about through the seed of the woman a snake crusher to destroy the serpent. This section is verses 21 to 31. Now, verse 21 is an awkward verse, okay? Now, it wasn't awkward to Moses, but it's a little awkward to us because Hebrew translators have had a lot of difficulty determining which son of Noah was older. Was it Shem or was it Japheth? And the major Bible versions are actually a bit of a mixed bag on this one. So some translators say that Japheth was older, while others say Shem was older. Well, we know Noah didn't have these three sons until he was how old? 500 years old. 500 years old. And we know when... One of Noah's sons was born specifically, and that's Shem. Shem was born when Noah was 502. So the Bible tells us that Noah did not begin to have these three sons until he was 500, and that he had Shem when he was 502. Because Shem turned 100 two years after the flood when Noah was 602. So it could be very well plausible that Japheth was the older one, perhaps born two years or so prior to his brother. But really, no matter. Uh, Well, verse 21 here in our text introduces us to Eber just briefly. And this actually skips ahead in the genealogy three generations. Uh, Eber was the great-grandson of Shem, and he'll end up being important insofar as he is one of the men that is in the line of Christ, the snake crusher. Well, Now we're introduced in verse 22 to the sons of Shem. There are five of them, Elam, Asher, Arpaxad, Lud, and Aram. Well, Elam is first. And we'll see this small nation pop up again over in Genesis 14. In Genesis 14, if you remember, Lot and his family, they go and they settle amongst two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And four kings rise up and make war with Bera, king of Sodom, and Bersha, king of Gomorrah, among others. And Lot and his family are taken away with the plunder. And so Abram's not too happy about this. So Abram goes and finds 318 fighting men, 
and he pursued these kings and rescued Lot and his family. Well, one of the kings that plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and took Lot and his family away was none other than the king of Elam. Elam is also mentioned in Jeremiah 49 as a nation that will be destroyed in God's judgment only to have its fortunes restored later. Now, Asher is next. Asher. Asher would go on to become the nation of Assyria. And Assyria in 2 Kings 17 fulfilled the prophecy against Israel and took Israel captive. It would be impossible here in one sermon to do justice to the over 150 times that Asher is mentioned in the Old Testament. So I will not attempt to do that justice this morning. Now, as far as Shem's son Lud, we know very little about him. He's mentioned just three other times in scripture. One of them is in Ezekiel 27, the lament of the destruction of Tyre. Aram is another son of Shem that did not leave a very good legacy. Now, Aram, Aram is the nation of Syria, not Assyria, but Syria. In Judges 10, we find that the nation of Israel worshipped the idols of the surrounding nations, so they turned to other gods. And one of those nations, we're told in Judges 10.6, that Israel worshipped were the gods of Syria. So that's Aram, Aram. In 2 Samuel 10, King David would do battle with the Syrians and kill 700 chariots and 40,000 horsemen. The Syrians would go on to do battle with Solomon. But years later, in 2 Kings 5, the captain of the army of the Syrians would capture a servant girl. And that servant girl would tell the captain, who was called Naaman, who was a leper, by the way, and God would use this servant girl to tell Naaman about the prophet Elisha. And Elisha would agree to heal Naaman in the waters of the Jordan of his leprosy for a specific purpose that he states in 2 Kings 5.8, let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. And that's Aram, Syria. Well, we're left with Arpak Sad, and I left him for last because he's the most important. And we really know nothing at all about him except that he is in the line of Christ the line of Christ. Arpaxad is God fulfilling his promise. God using ordinary people with no historical legacy to bring about the salvation of mankind just as he promised. Because as Philippians 2, 8, 9 tells us, salvation is all of God and nothing of us so that we can't boast. And that's Arpaxad. Okay, now, Aram, who we said was the nation of Syria, had four sons. That's in verse 23. The first son was Uz. Do you recall a prominent figure in scripture, perhaps who has a book named after him, who came from the land of Uz? That's Job. Job. The son of Aram was Uz. That's going to be it for Aram's sons. As far as Hul, Gether, and Mash, if you're looking there in verse 23, there's nothing else recorded about them. So we'll press on to verse 24. So we're back to Arpaxad in verse 24, back to the line of Christ. And Arpaxad fathers Sheila, or as some translations have it, Sala. And just as with Arpaxad, other than a genealogical record, we know nothing about Sheila except for who he fathered. And that man is Eber, the great grandson of Shem. And there is precious little else regarding Eber in the scriptures. So we move on to his progeny. Eber had a son named Peleg. Now Peleg is going to be an important character in the line of Christ because verse 25 of our text this morning states that it was in Peleg's day that something happened. Something happened in verse 25 in Peleg's day The earth was divided. And we'll look at that in our next chapter. So other than that, we know nothing about Peleg, but Peleg serves as a historical marker to Moses' audience. Okay, so Peleg's going to be our marker. Now, Peleg has a brother named Jokden. And folks, the only thing that we know about Jokden 
is if you count all those names there, he had 13 sons. And that's all we know. 13 sons. This is something as I'm studying this genealogy that's baffling to me, okay? And, and with any genealogy. It, it's, it's puzzling to me it, with regard to genealogies. Moses here in Genesis 10 takes the time to name the 13 sons of Joktan. And folks, other than knowing that the lands of Ophir and Havilah have lots of gold in them, we know nothing else about these 13 sons and the nations that came from them. Nothing. One big goose egg. And that puzzles me. It probably relieves you, but it puzzles me. Okay? In any event, these are the sons of Shem. Verse 32. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Verse 32 wraps us up with the summation. As I said, we began with a bookend, and we end with a bookend. These are the clans of Noah, and they spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Okay, bringing it all together. Bringing it all together. Why in the world would Moses choose to record this chapter? Why is it in the Bible? Folks, it's simple. Because God made promises. We see in Genesis 10, the fulfillment of God's promise to Noah and his sons of the blessing of procreation. That he had just promised a chapter prior when Noah offered burnt offerings and God blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And that's why Jochten's 13 sons are recorded. God fulfilling his promises. We see in Genesis 10, the fulfillment of God's promise to curse the son of Ham, Canaan. But most importantly, We see in Genesis 10 the fulfillment of God's promise that he made in Genesis 3.15. God promised, though they didn't have these specific details at the time, but he promised offspring, but a very specific offspring, the offspring of the woman. And we see that fulfilled through Shem, through Arpaxad, through Eber, through Peleg, and on through the generations down to Jesus. God promised the God-man, Jesus Christ, would leave his throne, come to earth, live a sinless life, and yet die a sinner's death for you and for me. He would take our sin on the cross and it would please the father to crush him and then raise him from the dead so that if we would confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead we will be saved rescued the anger of God averted and we would be called sons and daughters Friends, the snake crusher came. He came. We have been the beneficiaries of seeing that. And Genesis 10 was only the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise. And folks, as Paul writes in Romans 16, Jesus will gloriously crush all of his enemies, including that old serpent, Satan under his feet shortly. So I leave you with this. Rejoice in your God who not only 
promises, but is unfailing in bringing his promises to pass. Obey, love, and serve your great God, the God of Noah. Let's pray.